morning, everybody. Uh, before I start, let me just say thank you uh, to the organizers, Sally and Wendy and Peter, for putting all this together. Uh, thanks to Steve and Catherine for supporting this. And thank you, uh, everyone, for coming out this morning. I appreciate you being here. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes um, talking about uh, this research theme on circuits, computation, and cognition. I'm going to start uh, talking about this at the level of synapses, cells, uh, and small neural systems. And then Rosie Cowell, my colleague, uh, will come in and she will talk more about computational neuroscience, human neuroscience, and cognitive neuroscience that's going on on campus. As you can see from the title, this collection of researchers is a very big tent. So there's a lot of people that are involved in this kind of research. We won't be able to talk about everybody's research. But hopefully, uh, what I can do today is hit some of the high points and really touch on some of the exciting research that's going on on campus uh, that emphasizes a certain number of important aspects of what makes our research here unique. So this is just a, a quick graphical summary of a lot of the work that's going on. And this, as I mentioned, ranges from everything from, from cells and synapses all the way up to human, and beha human behavior and everything in between, including animal behavior, and importantly, synthetic systems. And this could be, for example, computational models that are, going, that are being developed, but also actual physical models that engineers on campus are actually developing that are based on the nervous system itself. And so I'll touch on a little bit of that research. And as you can see, our theme of circuits, computation, and cognition spans across all of these disciplines. So there are three uh, topics that I think are important for when we talk about this group, this circuits, computation, and cognition. In a lot of ways, this is most of neuroscience fits into this category. But there are things that I think are really important about the community of researchers on campus. Um, one is that they're working across multiple levels of analysis. And you can see this in the, this little graphical depiction over here on the left, or on your right. Um, people are working all the way from the levels of molecules up to the whole central nervous system, uh, even above the central nervous system at the level of behavior. Um, and they're using a lot of different kinds of models. And this could be different kinds of research models. It could also be different kinds of cognitive models and computational models. There's a very high focus on mechanisms. And this focus on mechanisms could be anything from understanding the physiology of neurons or circuits to mechanistic interpretations like mathematical mechanisms or computational principles underlying these processes. So that's a theme that, that underlies all this research. And perhaps one of the most important themes that really unites this group of people is a strong emphasis on integration and collaboration. So Sally mentioned this is a very integrative and collaborative group early on. I think it's really emblematized by a lot of the research um, in, these, in, in this category. And I'll try and highlight that uh, in some of the groups that I discuss in the next few minutes. Um, just to emphasize this, uh, this integration and collaboration, it goes on across multiple levels on campus. So obviously, there's lots of integration across labs, people who have shared interests. But there's also uh, collaboration across departments, across colleges on campus, even across the five college community. I'll highlight some examples of that. Um, there are developing collaborations with the medical school. I should note that I have perhaps one of the longest running collaborations with our esteemed guests. Uh, we've been working together for a few years now, uh, since I was an undergraduate. Um, but this basically highlights um, that there's a lot of collaboration in this group. Here's a subset of these, uh, the, the different groups that are participating. And what I really just am showing this to show you the diversity of input that we get from uh, along these lines. So we get everything from, from your traditional neuroscience categories, psychological and brain sciences and biology, but we're also bringing in members of electrical and computer engineering, computer science, mathematics, and statistics. We have a strong connection with the Institute for Applied Life Sciences, so trying to bring these computational principles in line with an applied thematic research. And then, of course, the developing Center for Data Science on campus, which we're just now developing connections with, I think is going to be a real boon uh, for interactions among our community. This slide just breaks down what I showed you graphically into some actual details. We've got people who participate in this kind of research come from at least 30 faculty, at least 10 or more departments. Um, I've clustered this into three general groups, looking at the more <laughs> cellular and molecular neuroscience, the more systems and behavioral neuroscience, and then the more cognitive and computational neuroscience. And you can see that there's a number of faculty from numbers of different departments, and that they span across multiple disciplines. So you'll see some names that are similar uh, in the different categories. And to some degree, that comes because people are interested in multiple themes. In some ways, that comes because groups are collaborating with one another and sharing their expertise and knowledge <laughs> across groups. And this is. Just an example of this, again, to sort of impress you with how these connections are made. Here are four examples. This is not exhaustive, I should say. And neither was the previous list. There's probably more people that I'm, I'm neglecting. But here's just a snapshot of research that I actually know about on campus and, and to some degree participate in. Um, each line here is an active research collaboration that's going on between groups. So you can see there are examples of collaboration within departments like psychological brain sciences. 
There are cross-departmental collaborations. Again, this is all within the, the general theme of neuroscience. And then you can see there's actually connections with physics, with electrical and computer engineering, where people are bringing very different areas of expertise together to attack a particular problem. And I think these are sort of very exciting new developments uh, that our community has got uh, going for it. Obviously, uh, we apply very diverse uh, research models. So this is a, just a, a schematic of all the different research models, experimental research models that are being used. I don't really need to dwell on this because it sort of runs the gamut from the traditional rodent models up to the more sophisticated primate models uh, and, and even the com computational models, both physical and, and, uh, and uh, mathematical. <coughs> So using this, this uh, hierarchical level here as a guide, I want to take you through a few snapshots of different research projects. Again, keeping in mind that these are groups that are very interested in mechanisms, and these are groups that are very interested in collaborative research. And the first place that I want to start is sort of at the molecules to network level. And one of the really exciting things about this line of research on campus is that we literally have people who are working at the molecular level, going all the way up to uh, cellular neurophysiology, circuit development, up through to cognition. And so let me give you a few examples of some of this research. And I want to start with one of the newest members of the neuroscience community on campus, Meg Stratton, who is a professor in biochemistry and molecular biology. And so this is exciting that we've got people at the level, uh, not just in your traditional psychology and biology departments, in bio biochemistry and molecular biology, working on fundamental questions that are at the heart of cognition and learning. And specifically, Meg is interested in how this protein, calcium clomodulin kinase, <laughs> maintains memory over time, potentially through exchanging protein subunits. So really providing a protein basis for all of the cognitive and computational aspects of things that we're talking about today. This is very exciting research. If we zoom out a little bit, we can actually focus on the level of the synapse and the actual neuron. Uh, Genglin Li, who is a professor in the Department of Biology, is an expert in in vitro neurophysiology and imaging and is really interested in temporal precision in the nervous system. And so he uses this to study um, auditory signaling in his own lab. But importantly, Ganglin is a hugely collaborative member of the community. So he's worked with behavioral neuroscientists like Heather Richardson and Luke Remage Healy to study how forebrain structures process temporal information and neuroplasticity. But he, he collaborates with a, a large number of other community members on campus. Um, and that will be highlighted in future slides. Um, leveraging the power of his techniques uh, at a lot of different questions. Another extremely uh, exciting collaboration that I wanted to highlight today is work that's being led by Jerry Downs, who's in the Department of Biology. So he has been working with Jim Chambers, who is a chemical neuroscientist and also the director of the Imaging Center in the Institute for Applied Life Sciences, and Joseph Trapani, who is at Amherst College. So this is really you know, working across colleges, uh, across disciplines. And they just recently got an NSF grant to investigate the development and function of locomotor circuits in the zebrafish. And I just wanted to highlight what they've done here is they've come up with these new light-activated GABA receptors. So using a new form of optogenetics that will actually allow them to precisely control GABA signaling in the zebrafish, in the awake-behaving zebrafish, and study the, the influence that uh, this GABA system has on development and function uh, in this very powerful genetic model uh, that we can use for a lot of disease, uh, different, different types of disease study. So along these lines of collaboration and using zebrafish's models, you saw the beautiful work that Joe just showed uh, looking at imaging in the mouse. So now Joe and Rolf Karlstrom, who's in the Department of Biology, have initiated a new collaboration where they can use these uh, amazing techniques to uh, image the entire zebrafish brain. Okay, we know that the zebrafish is a really important genetic and biochemical model that we can use. And now Joe and Rolf have actually been able to leverage this, this uh, clarity and light sheet scanning to image at a cellular resolution the whole zebrafish brain. And the amazing thing is that they can do this in approximately five minutes. So they can get the whole brain at the level of cells and synapses, five minutes per brain. So this is high throughput, powerful uh, work that can really be applicable to what, what is a, a really important model in neuroscience research. So stepping away from zebrafish and stepping away from, some, from biological systems, I want to highlight um, a series of collaborations that are actually being led by members of the electrical engineering, uh, electrical and computer engineering group. So there's two groups here. Um, Chengfei Zha and Jun Yan, who's actually in the Department of Physics, have been working on developing new types of electrodes. These are electrodes that can record from enormous numbers of neurons, thousands of neurons, using new, mod, uh, new uh, materials 
like graphene and silicon. And it's really kind of revolutionizing our capacity for neurophysiology, both in behaving animal systems and in in vitro slice traps. Also exciting uh, line of research that's being done by members of the uh, engineering community, Cheng Fei Zha and Joshua Yang are developing what are called neuromorphic models of, of uh, neural function. And these are actual physical models. They're actually models on chips that, act that, that actually um, implement synaptic properties um, in a highly scalable technique. So you can b basically create n huge numbers of chips that actually process in a synaptic fashion, have very similar properties to neural systems. And we can use this to both study how the brain itself works and understand how systems work in an, an embodied model, but also we can then apply this information to things like cognitive function, like object recognition and speech recognition. So this is not only important from a research perspective, but also from a technology applications development perspective. Again, highlighting the power of these collaborations. Okay, now I want to move up a little bit uh, level to now focus on less on the, the cellular and circuit mechanism, but on the systems neuroscience and the behavioral neuroscience and how we integrate circuits with, uh, in this case, animal behavior and physiology. Again, using some of these modern techniques, neurophysiology and optogenetics and chemogenetics, to understand how neural circuits work. So to get at Jose's question for Joe earlier, once we know how these circuits are laid out, how do we actually study how they work? And that's what this group of scientists are doing. Again, in collaboration, I want to highlight this, in collaboration with multiple computational scientists on campus. So I just want to give you a few examples. Um, Elena Vesey, who is a, another recent uh, recruit to our neuroscience community in the Department of Biology, is studying how the noradrenergic locus ceruleus system is involved in regulating a whole host of behaviors. She uh, uses optogenetics and chemogenetics to control these neurons and study their function, and has shown a huge number of really important findings, ranging from how this system is involved in arousal from anesthesia, to <laughs> cognitive and behavioral functions, to models of Parkinson's disease and Down syndrome. So again, taking these tools at a circuit level, applying them to both translational and fundamental basic research. Um, Joe Bergen, again, uh, looking at the hypothalamus, has shown that when he can express um, these optogenetic constructs, so he expresses channel rhodopsin in a specific population of neurons in the hypothalamus, the galenin neurons, and when he controls these neurons in male mice, what he actually does is he can influence their aggressive behavior. So he turns on these neurons, and the mice, normally male mice, will attack uh, young male pups. That's sort of an innate pre-programmed behavior. When Joe turns on these neurons, the mice cease attacking their pups. And instead, what's shown here in yellow, they spend all of their time grooming the pups. So Joe can actually switch an aggressive behavior into a nurturing behavior through the power of optogenetic control. So this is, again, one of the really powerful uses of these technologies. Um, work in my lab is interested in behaving animals, integrating optogenetics, for example, and uh, neurophysiology, specifically to understand, again, how the functions of these neural systems map onto their actual identity. So we record the activity of neurons during behavior and try and record from it a huge number of, of neurons, if possible, populations of neurons. And then we use optogenetics to identify the neurons that we've recorded from. So we say, ah, this neuron is a prefrontal cortex neuron that projects to the nucleus accumbens, or that is uh, a GABA receptor expressing neuron, or something along those lines. So again, trying to sort of get a multidimensional framework on neural systems. And just the last thing that I want to highlight in this group is, again, I mentioned that there are constant collaborations with computational neuroscientists and other computational scientists. So this is collaborative work that my lab, Geng Lin Li's lab, Joe Bergen's lab, has been performing with Li Jin Gao. So Li Jin is a professor in electrical and computer engineering, and she is an expert in, among other things, graph theory analysis, which is not as commonly applied to systems-level neuroscience. And so we've been working with Li Jin, she's really been spearheading this, um, on understanding how these multiple neural spike trains that I've been telling you about, these neurophysiological signals, actually work as a network. So looking for causal relationships, looking for patterns or motifs that let us, again, map on the structure of the nervous system to the function of the nervous system, and then ultimately how this influences behavior. And I should note that this is not the only example of this on campus. There are members of um, math and uh, statistics on campus that are interested in understanding mathematical principles of neurophysiology. There are members of other colleges around. Uh, Ethan Myers, who's over at Hampshire College in statistics, is a computational neuroscientist interested in um, neural coding. 
And up, coming up now, I'd like to bring Rosie, who's going to give you a real success story about how computational scientists and neuroscientists can come together and actually really answer some specific questions. Hi. Again, thanks to the organizers. I won't interrupt the flow too long. Um, so I'm going to sort of finish the second half of this. Can you hear me? Should I be? Do I need to lean over? I'm quite loud anyway, so you can probably hear me at the back. Um, I'm going, yeah, I'm going to finish off telling you about uh, the sort of upper end of those levels of biological analysis and the more human, uh, getting towards the, the human subjects and the cognition, questions of cognition. But first I'm going to um, talk to you about a project that's actually, uh, was a collaboration between Luke Remish healy and myself, which really bridges these levels of um, analysis. So Luke... Um, Luke came to me and said, I've got these, I've got these really interesting data. This is quite low-level biological data, um, spike trains from songbirds. And, you know, I really want to probe what's, um, what information is contained in these spike trains. What kind of codes do they contain and how are those codes influenced by um, neurotransmitters being present or absent? He said, and I think maybe pattern classifiers could help with that. You know, do, do you want to be involved with this? Can you help me? And so together, and I said, sure, this sounds great. This is some fantastic relatively low level, for me, low level data. I'm getting my hands on real neural data. Um, so what Luke had was, um, as I said, um, firing patterns from single neurons in the brains of songbirds as they listen to auditory stimuli, so the songs either of um, conspecifics or um, other species. And he said, I want to know whether these, um, th the, the signals that I'm recording from these birds' brains are discriminable from each other. Can they tell on the basis of these signals what it is they're listening to? And does that does the discriminability, does how different they are, um, change when we when the birds um, have uh, norepinef more norepinephrine in that region of their cortex? So we took those spike trains and we used um, a, a technology for um, a technique from machine learning, which I use in my lab with human brain brain imaging data called a, a support vector machine classifier. And it's just a, a way of training a computer to discriminate between different patterns of data. And we asked, we used that classifier to ask the question, how separable are these neural auditory codes for the songs of different birds? And is this separability enhanced by norepinephrine? And we found that the answer is um, they are relatively separable. And yes, it is enhanced by norepinephrine. So that was really fun for me to use some of the techniques that I use with brain imaging data at this lower level in songbirds, and it was fun for me to get to know some of the work that was going on in Luke's lab. Um, and that was published last year. So, um, so now moving on really to this upper level of these, uh, this um, sort of schematic of the levels of biological analysis, I'm going to tell you about human cognition and all the PIs on campus who are really looking at the brain from the level of networks all the way up to the central nervous system as a whole. And the techniques that we're using as a group, there's, there's very many of us, there's at least 10, 15, maybe more, and I'm, again, this is not going to be exhaustive, but um, the techniques that we use include electroencephalography, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and of course we're all very excited about the new scanner which arrived on campus in November and which should be up and running by the summer. Um, I went over there the other day, it's beautiful, <laughs> we're really excited. Um, many of us use behavioural tests of cognition, uh, so asking UMass undergrads to go down into our labs and press buttons on the computer for us, which they gladly do. Um, test, and then many of us also use testing in human clinical populations, so patients with brain damage, um, looking at the deficits in cognition and working backwards from that to understand brain function. And then also there's a strong, a very strong theme on this campus of using computational modelling. And um, many of us sort of do that in-house, so many of us are actually sort of primarily theoretical scientists. It's not just a collaboration with other departments, but we, we build our own theoretical computational models and then we test them with behavioral tests of cognition or EEG or fMRI. So, and then the, the, in terms of the questions that we're asking, that really spans a, a wide range as well. There's people, there's a lot of expertise in memory on, in human neuroscience. People also study perception. Um, we have uh, a strong group in development. Um, we also have Becky Spencer, who's a leading sleep researcher. And she overlaps with many of us um, in the other areas as well. We've got strengths in attention and in speech and language. And I'm quickly and, and again, all of these the aspects of cognition are being um, investigated at these sort of upper levels of the biological scales. So um, I'm going to sort of just summarise each of those areas with a few kind of newspaper 
headline style questions just to give you a flavor of what we research. So we're asking questions like, is amnesia, as in, you know, um, memory impairments, a, a classic sort of memory impairment disorder caused by damage usually in the medial temporal lobe, is it really an impairment in perception primarily rather than an impairment in memory? Um, if we manage to demonstrate that, then that would be kind of a, a controversial claim. Um, another one of our PIs is asking, and this is Dave Huber's question, did the grid cell Nobel Prize winners have the wrong idea about what grid cells do? <laughs> so they recently won a Nobel Prize for um, their work finding these, these um, gloriously, exquisitely tuned cells in the entorhinal cortex that respond in a grid-like pattern. They have grid-like receptive fields when the rat is running around a spatial arena in two dimensions. <coughs> and it's been, and it was, when that was reported in the news, it was all like, you know, Nobel Prize for scientists who discovered the brain's GPS system. It was all about spatial navigation. So Dave's idea is that actually the spatial navigation thing is a kind of a, well, it, it, it is used for that, but it comes as a sort of a side, a side benefit because really what the, this grid cell type system is doing is, is a general um, representational system that's optimal for all um, types of memory. And so actually he's collaborating with me. We're going to try and test this in the new UMass scanner when it, when it uh, comes online to look at whether we can find these grid cell type representations for dimensions other than space. So we're going to be looking in early visual cortex and looking for um, grid cell type representations for orientation and color, very simple visual features, to test this idea that the grid cells are really a more general representational system. Dave is also asking, was Freud wrong about memory suppression in the human brain? So he's really taking on the big questions. Um, <laughs> Because um, there, are, there are a number of researchers outside of UMass who have theories of memory suppression, and um, uh, Dave has his own theories, which do not coincide with those. Um, and then there are several of us looking, on, looking at these questions. So Jeff Starnes, Karen Rotello, and I um, are interested in memory and in why people think they remember things that actually never happened. So some of the hypotheses we have are that it's a faulty decision process, or in, in my lab we're investigating the idea that it's actually the result of perceptual interference so, um, you know, lots of visual information tricking your memory. And again, that comes back to the idea that amnesia is really a problem with visual perception rather than memory. And so I should add that I've just sort of thrown the PI's names at the top there because um, th many of these questions are quite collaborative and there's, there's crosstalk between labs to answer these questions. Um, and then I have a slide for some of the labs just to sort of give you an idea of some of the techniques that we're <laughs> using. So in my lab, um, like I said, many of us are quite theory driven. So we use um, neural network modeling, which is quite a central component of what we do. And most neural networks make predictions both for behavior. So you can, you can have the neural network learn a task, like object recognition memory. And then um, you can lesion a chunk of it and see whether its behavior is impaired in the same way that patients with brain damage are impaired. And we can also use these models to make predictions for brain imaging data, um, which, which we're hoping to move into soon. And so we're doing fMRI. Um, in my lab and now we're trying to get the neural network models to kind of um, accommodate that fMRI data. Um, again, to answer questions about the mechanisms of memory and vision in humans. Um, in Dave's lab, he's um, again quite theory driven. He's using, using neural network and Bayesian models of cognition to answer questions about how memory works, whether suppression doesn't really happen after all, whether um, where the grid cells are not really about space, but instead about a general system for representing things. And he has tested his models um, with behavior, so undergrads pressing buttons in front of the computer, and also with electroencephalography. And now, through collaboration with my lab, he's using fMRI also to test his theories. Um, and then I have a slide for Jeff Starnes also, who um, is, again, another quite theory-driven lab. So he uses mathematical modeling to ask why, how people remember events and why do they remember some things that never happened. Um, and he really thinks about it a lot in terms of decision processes. So this here is a graph showing you um, the evidence for a particular uh, choice when you're deciding whether you remember something or not. And that evidence accumulates over time. And you either, it either drifts towards saying yes or drifts towards saying no. And this kind of model has a lot of explicit um, information inside it and he uses um, behavioral testing, behavioral data in undergrads to constrain his models and, and to decide which is the right model. Um, so in the area of development, we have some really exciting work going on. Again, Yunbin Kwak and Jun Pu Park are both quite new to campus. They've been here a year and a half, I believe. And they're, they're doing some really great work asking um, 
What changes in the adolescent brain underlie the terrible decisions that youngsters can make? Again, newspaper headline. I'm sure young Ben would never write that in a, an article. Um, <laughs> but we all know it's true. Um, and then Junku Park is, um, is asking interesting questions about how we, how we perceive um, our primitive number sense, basically, how we perceive quantity. When you look at a, a bunch of dots on a page, you kind of have a sense of whether there are 10 or whether there are 7 without actually counting them. So it's almost like a visual, perceptual task that people are doing, and yet they, people do it very well. Um, so he's asking about basic mechanisms of how people do that, but he's also then asking whether this is, even though it seems like a sort of a visual, has a visual feel to it, is this something that we can train in children to make them better at math? Um, and talking of training in children, Becky Spencer has done some high profile and very interesting research <coughs> looking at naps and sleep in, in the same age group, in, in preschoolers and school kids, uh, uh, maybe a little younger than um, June's subjects, but preschool, I was asking whether sleep is really um, has a beneficial effect on learning. So, and learning more broadly construed in Becky's lab, I believe. So here, um, you're gonna, so Jung Bin does this um, work on development, and specifically looking at motivation, um, how motivation changes brain behavior, whether that underlies the terrible decisions. And you'll hear more about her work at the other end of the age spectrum in older Parkinsonian patients, I think from Becky Reedy later on. Um, and again, June's work is really um, looking at um, mathematical abilities and whether we can develop tools to enhance them. And he uses behavior, behavioral measures, so looking at what kids do, um, and EEG measures of brain function, and also fMRI. So June is another person who's pretty excited by the new scanner arriving. Um, and as I said, Becky Spencer's done doing this fabulous work in sleep, looking at what is the function of brain activity during sleep. So using measures like fMRI and, poly and um, EEG um, to analyze the way that the, the brain activation changes during sleep and whether that has an effect, has a, a relationship with learning before and after sleep. Um, okay, and finally, the, the last group of human level researchers I wanna tell you about is we have some particular strengths in um, audition and speech with PIs Lisa Sanders and Alexandra Yesser. So they're asking some really fascinating questions I've only learned about recently. Um, so Lisa has a hypothesis that I believe she has some preliminary evidence for that when older people struggle to understand speech in a noisy environment, it's not just because they're, uh, they've got hearing loss, but it's because they're paying attention to the wrong things. So it's not just a sort of physical sensory deficit, it might also be a cognitive deficit. If that's true, that's gonna radically change the face of hearing loss research and hearing loss treatment. And relatedly, Alexandra Yesser, sort of at the same time, is coming up with, um, with pretty profound recommendations for hearing loss patients as well, because she's found that, um, paradoxically, it can be better to only have one cochlear implant than two. And that's because it turns out, that she, her lab has discovered recently, that um, sometimes people are using residual hearing in the ear that they don't have an implant in, some of the lower frequencies that you don't get from a cochlear implant. And it's not always the case that it'll be in the other ear. Sometimes you have residual hearing in the ear where you do have an implant. But many people have an implant in one ear and they're using the low frequencies from the other ear. And if they were to have a second implant, it might mess that up <laughs> and really make their speech comprehension worse. So, um, so yeah, so Lisa is taking these measures of, um, well, she's taking measures of brain, uh, brain activation from EEG and measures of the acoustic environment from the lab to the real world with her latest stuff, which is really exciting. So she might be actually doing some important basic science alongside translational applications. And Alexandra, I, I mentioned that she has this interesting finding with the cochlear implants. She's also interested more generally in some basic science questions like, how do we combine visual and auditory information to recognize speech? Um, how do we adjust to speakers? And again, she uses behavioral measures, but also EEG measures, electroencephalography. Um, so to summarize all this human stuff, this human end, and also going back right to the beginning to the, the beautiful work that David presented, we've really got a, a real, really sort of wide range spanning the entire gamut of biological scales here at UMass for this cluster. Um, we have both theoretical and empirical labs, um, and we have a wide range of methodological techniques, and as David pointed out, and hopefully I've mentioned as well, we've got many existing collaborations between labs. But what we'd like to know from the experts who are here is where could we do better? Do we need more translation or better relation to clinical work from the basic science? Do we need better integration across labs for sharing the expertise we have? 
um, for sharing our equipment, or, or is it a more fundamental integration that we need by developing unified questions to be investigated at these different levels, all the way from neurons all the way up to the, the CNS, um, rather than sort of, in some cases, maybe working a little bit separately on related questions that we haven't brought together. Um, and to, to achieve the, the things that we need to do better, what existing strengths should we capitalise on? That's another question that we have for the experts. So thanks very much for taking the time to listen.